My name is Jamie Howard, and welcome to the first of four sessions on working with hard emotions, teaching the IFS psychotherapy approach. And you may notice that this isn't live. <laughs> I'm recording this on Zoom. Had some te technical difficulties when trying to record it live. And actually this might even be better um, to do it. Well, the video and the audio should be better. Um, and I guess I could stop and retake if I, if I make mistakes. Um, so um, uh, this video is for people who missed the first session or may just wanna be watching um, my take on how to do a, a crash course in learning IFS. And the focus is really, uh, it's not for people who will be my clients. So um, part of the reason I'm going to go way off into neurobiology and how I think parts are created um, is so I think you get a better understanding of how um, they, uh, they emerge and why IFS works as it is, as it does. Um, rather than just follow me and, and learn the terms. So let's see, let's share. So working with anger and strong emotions using IFS for healing and wellness is the title. And I thank the Monteverdi Institute for hosting the four two-hour workshops, I guess we can call them, um, this August 2023. And let's just stay there while I do a little intro. So anybody who's going to be watching this video and or coming to these workshops is interested in working with hard emotions. And so without asking you to share anything and to try to be respectful so that we don't uncover things that you don't want to uncover until you're ready, um, I'm going to go slowly. And um, Dick Schwartz, the founder of IFS, is very much focused on don't go until you get permission and go gently. Make sure everybody feels safe. That's why you can't get there on your own anyway. So I'm gonna start off with this thing I thought would be helpful called the container. And it's presented in different ways. I'm gonna do it quickly. And so you can come back to it and work it at the depth you'd like. So I'd like you to imagine a container made of anything you want, a metal case, a wood box, a leather trunk, a ceramic vessel that you can put things in and seal it shut so that you can put in any strong emotions, fear, shame, anger. And so it can be safe, so you can stay focused on what we're talking about. And on the front of this container, there's a faucet with a sign above it that says, only to open for therapeutic purposes. And if you want to, you can open the faucet and let out a couple of drops and then you can work with it, but we won't want to work with more than we can handle at any time. So I think this is a good piece to use your imagination. So put all of your emotions in there that you may be concerned could arise during the workshop. They are safely contained. You are showing the parts that are holding these emotions that you care for them and are gonna take care of. Just I'll give you a minute just to use your imagination and put stuff in there, seal it shut. I don't see my face in the corner as they usually have in these Zoom recordings, but I will assume I'm there. All right. I'm also going to start this 
workshop off a little unorthodoxly um, by starting with a part of IFS that I think is very powerful. And I'd like to set the tone for um, the workshop going forward. And I can see that the formatting didn't quite work on this. Um, at the core of IFS is a concept called self with a capital S and cap and self with a capital S is um, or can be described. You can access it and think about are you having some of this self energy, self qualities with these eight C words. So compassion, curiosity, confidence, calmness, clarity, creativity, courageousness, and connected, connected with yourself, with others, or God, source, nature, truth, whatever feels important to you. I like to um, go deeper than um, word plays and little tricks like this. So I think it's important that we don't just see what might be referred to as your best self, even a spiritual self, we'll get into that. Um, we need you know, the words love and kindness. Behind, behind curiosity is openness and acceptance. Very important to be in that state. And confidence may include grounded and being strong. Calmness, a uh, really powerful word often I've heard used a lot in Buddhism is equanimity, patience, wise, wisdom, insight, being playful and humorous is often very important in the moment for healing and for getting yourself out of a bad state of mind. And being committed and present, warm presence, I think is really important to connect it to yourself, connect it to others. So these eight C words make up self foundations of well-being and healing and yes from self is where you can heal yourself so with those eight c words i'm going to start a do a little affirmation let's keep them in mind all through the workshop let's be curious open non-judgmental non-clinging to beliefs and or and our stories Let's be compassionate with others here and out there in the world and compassionate with the hurt and struggle that is within each one of us. Let's have confidence and courage to stand up for ourselves, often with the strength to not have to be right or to tell someone else, including those from our, our past, what is and what is not okay. When feeling strong emotions, may we find the calmness and the clarity to drop the story and be present with what is in the moment, with compassion. Oftentimes, that requires creativity. And lastly, may we feel the connectedness we have with each other, with nature and the earth, and with ourselves. That is already there, but we may have trouble feeling it. And we will talk about, so this is self with a capital S at the core of every human being. And then there is non-self. So we will be looking at that. All right. The big picture of IFS, simplified. This is the way I see it. This is not the way Dick Schwartz teaches it, but this is how I teach it. There is your best self. And there are your best, your not best selves. They're plural. Lots of selves who are judgmental or arrogant or not good enough or raging, etc. And those are selves, not just emotions that we have. Healing through IFS comes from three basic, the three basic components of IFS. 
One, we improve skills to access and embody that best self, those eight C qualities, how you can, you can access, access them from inside yourself. And the main work in IFS is working with all of those other not best selves, which we will be calling parts. But I don't wanna get stuck in the terminology yet, just I think you get this concept. And working with means that we will actually be accessing them and having conversations with them and negotiating with them and uh, talking about transforming them, maybe giving them different roles to play in your well being. And ultimately, deep healing has to go down to the deep hurt and trauma, which is underneath um, all of the thinking emotions and behaviors that are not your best self. And we're not going to do that, probably, probably not going to do that during this uh, webinar. Um, want to make sure that there's safety and we're really connected before we deep do that deep work. However, it may happen on its own. If uh, deep inside you, scared parts of you feel that you're better able to deal with things, some of that fear may dissolve. All right. To do those things, we need to know, and this is the kind of the practice of IFS. First, you notice that there's something that needs attention. For instance, you might notice you're anxious and you don't know why or think you need to be anxious or it's too much. So you're noticing it. It's in your body. And then the next piece is to notice that that's happening on autopilot. That, and I call the autopilot is anything that's coming from your subconscious that you didn't choose to bring up. You, didn't, you don't choose a lot of your thoughts, most of your thoughts. You don't choose almost any of your emotions and nor sensations. So that comes from, I like the word autopilot. And know that you can switch from this autopilot anxiety to mindful awareness. You can see if you can do some of that work we talked about earlier about accessing self with a capital S, and those are those eight C words and the other words that I added, any other words you wanna add to your best self. And then we often go to the body because we can see manifesting in ourselves, whatever's going on, the anxiety, the rage, the uh, embarrassment, it's manifest in the body, thoughts, emotions, and behaviors, you can see the urges and in, in all in the body. And then we're gonna learn as we notice that we're accessing more of your best self and your mind is seeing that and you're also noticing that there's something that was given to you by your subconscious that we will be able to have a relationship. We relate to the part from the mind and we'll get there, the mind state of self. And from self, we can often negotiate so that the part steps back, which means that the part st stops giving you so much anxiety or it uh, calms you down or you can put the cookie down <laughs> and not eat the cookie. All those are parts making you do things. And then if you get good at this and the part and parts see that you are good at accessing your best self, they can go, oh, I guess we don't need to do what we learned to do when we were a kid. So we will trust that you from self can lead. We call that self-leadership. All right, and to do that, we're gonna need to learn a bunch of things. So sorry if this is almost a college semester course in psychology, but um, um, every week we'll do two, three, four of these things. And uh, so there's lots of learning to be done. And uh, along the way, we'll do practices. So it's not just facts and information. And by weeks three and four, maybe we can do some, some deeper work. So we need to learn about which one is the real you. So when uh, everybody talks to themselves, so which one is you, both of them? If you have a part that says, you idiot, is that you? I'm gonna argue, <laughs> present the case that that's what we call a part that comes from your subconscious. It was created out of your life experience, but when you notice it 
you can notice, wait, that's not the way I want to be talking to myself. That's the real you. So we'll get there. Um, I like to use the terms brain and mind in different ways. It's not the way neurobiologists necessarily do it, but um, I don't think I do this later, so I'll do this now. So I call the brain everything that the organ up there does on autopilot. So we know that the brain um, is responsible for keeping the heart beating and circulation and also for your lungs to, to breathe and uh, air to circulate the immune system, digestive systems, but the brain also, um, it's not just in your head kind of uh, thinking, thinking and feeling and sensations are all the subconscious work of your brain, that organ, um, when it's doing it on its own. And all other animals have a brain that have them think and feel and are, they're conscious. They don't have language and self-awareness probably, some species may, but I'm gonna go with no for just to make it, we'll talk about the difference of being human. So the brain is all of that that's working on you know, nature. Um, and the mind is what comes out of the brain. That's this emergent, fantastic quality that can know that it is itself, that it is alive, that it's self-awareness, that it can say, hey, that's not the way I want things. I can change things or, I can, uh, I can imagine is so important in being a human and that comes out of the mind uh, and using cognitive abilities, um, brain and mind. And, in, uh, and so IFS, we're gonna be talking about parts and self with a capital S and we'll get into the details of that. There's two basic kinds of parts and um, I wanna describe why um, in humans they develop as they do um, and how um, using this terminology really makes it helpful that we can do the work to heal ourselves. So knowing about parts and self is important. Um, I will constantly um, refer back to autopilot and the subconscious and that it's not you, that's your brain that's doing it and that you are the one who's going to be choosing with your values, your intention. And that's often to change what your brain and autopilot is doing. Memory, we need to learn about um, and discuss why, how memory is for humans and how critical that is for um, how we solve our problems and why we suffer also. So we'll look into memory and survival strategies. Those are two of the things that are behind the two kinds of parts. And um, um, I wanna do some some exploration of feelings and emotions, because I think they drive everything. So um, they're behind thoughts and, um, and what it feels like is gonna make you do things. And so we wanna understand them so we have better control over your feelings and emotions, managing hard emotions. And I will try to include two, three exercises every week so that you go have things to practice and work on. Um, and um, so that it all comes together for you. So that's, we need to do that. All right, so this is kind of fun. So will the real you step forward? So when you talk to yourself, which is you? As I mentioned before, you get something gets you up in the morning and says, go to the bathroom, make some coffee, do this, do that. And, it's, and then um, something is going, oh yeah, I need to remember. Yeah, so we've got this, uh, somewhat conscious parts of ourselves, but all through the day, there's um, things when you notice that you might, when you become conscious of them, want things to go differently. So another part of you kicks in and it may be more from self, but it may be another part. You may uh, start reaching for the Fruit Loops and, um, and then another part of you goes, wait a minute, that's for the kids. Um, I don't allow myself to eat that sugar. Now you're going to have a discussion between it was kind of the devil and the angel on your shoulders. No, I want some sugar. I deserve it. No, that's bad for you. You're going to die early, whatever. <laughs> so we can watch ourselves and we can watch. And also sometimes you might be in an argument and you can have a, a voice and a perspective that's watching you in an argument with your partner and like a fly on the wall watching you. And um, I know many times I've said 
to myself, don't say that, don't say that, or I'm texting and I'm going, oh, don't send this text. You're really only seven years old, the one who's writing this text. I send it and the person writes back, hey, what are you, seven? I think I was. So you can watch yourself talking, behaving, you can watch yourself craving, oh, I gotta pull myself back from that Krispy Kreme shop across the street. We have language, part of me go, wants to go out and part of me wants to stay in. So that's part of, part of how Dick Schwartz and his clients came up with, well, let's just use the word part then. We say, I'm of two minds. I can't make up my mind. Um, let me just put a little, um, what's the word? Um, not warning, but uh, just in, um, to acknowledge that if some of my comments are more apropos for English and not for Spanish, my apologies. Um, I don't know Spanish as well as I know English. So I'll just state that. Um, we can notice that there's something is making us want to eat or not eat. Something is keeping us from exercising. Something is making us procrastinate. Something keeps us up till late in the, in the night, doom scrolling, looking at screens, can't put them down. And we might just say, oh, you know, that's just some kind of you know, anxiety addiction. But as we get into it, we can really experience that these are parts of your psyche that have an agenda and we can actually talk to them and negotiate with them. And that's, <laughs> sounds, I'm sure it sounds really strange, but it's, it's really cool when it starts working for you. Every human being, as far as I know, have inner critics, except for maybe um, narcissists, and, uh, but they're critical. They're, they're so arrogant because they think they're not as good in most, most cases, I think. So we all have, like one day I was doing the dishes and I turned the water on full, full steam, full flow, and I put a bowl underneath it. Maybe I was just waking up, wasn't very thoughtful. And I put the bowl in and the water went down one side and it sprayed all over me. <laughs> and the great part of this experience was that out of my mouth came, you idiot. And that happened faster than my consciousness. So my consciousness observed you idiot as if it was another person. And I went, who said that? You know, I just called myself an idiot. I just did a very silly mistake. And um, so I had a little laugh and talked to myself, but it was indicative. I have a part that really wants me to be thoughtful, don't want to do stupid things like that. I'm very thoughtful and carefully planned. And that part is pissed that it didn't have control at that moment. Um, I've worked with a lot of clients who have what I call saboteurs. They... Um, just when something big is about to happen, they do something and spoil the whole thing. And saboteurs usually are a part in your psyche whose strategy is, well, if I let you go out and do it, you would have made a fool of yourself. So they might be involved in a fear of failure. Have you ever driven home? I guess you have to have driven on more roads. I don't know if that works up here in Monteverde, but you ever driven home and you went a bunch of places and then you get home and you turn off the car and you go, wait a minute, I wasn't conscious that whole ride home. And I hope I stopped at lights and put on my turn signal and, and uh, was careful. I have no idea what I did, but I mentioned that that's not quite the same thing. That's dissociation. I wouldn't say that's necessarily a part, but it really does show another level of how we can be on autopilot and we can function on autopilot for most of our lives. I think uh, this guy named Bruce Lipton, who wrote a book called The Biology of Belief. And uh, I think he said that we're on autopilot 95% of the time. So right now, you are listening to me either, well, if you were in a session, you're listening to me live, or you're watching this, this uh, YouTube video, and you're not really thinking sound waves are coming out of your speakers and they're going in your ears. Your ears then turn into you know, vibrations that turn into electrical signals or something that goes to the part of the brain that turns it into English and it turns it into meaning. And what does it mean? And then it quickly scans your relative uh, relevant memories. And does this make sense to me? Is he full of it? Or is it that's pretty interesting? Or I have no idea what he's talking about. So all that's happening in real time. <laughs> and 
you can put some effort in, especially now that I've mentioned it. You might go, mm, I'm going to pay more attention to these words and these concepts, but it can be a totally on autopilot. Um, so um, in other kinds of therapies, you may have heard uh, mention of, of like, that's my inner child, my inner little boy or little girl. And um, so there's something that corresponds to that in IFS. Um, and uh, they are the holders of pain and stories from the past. And we'll talk about um, what they are. But so that's part of this. Um, but that inner child, is that you? We can contact that and we can have a conversation and we can help heal that inner child. So which is you? Well, it's a part of you is what we're gonna say. But you is really gonna be the mature, wise adult who's gonna be in relationship to your inner child who isn't out there paying taxes and living in the world and in relationships, but we want to respect him. But so the real you is the observer. And in meditation, there's the perfect example. So for those of you who have meditated, the uh, instruction is usually settle in, put your mind on your breath, noticing your breath, breathing in, breathing out. And then before long, could be seconds, you will notice that, oh, my attention is not on my breathing. My attention is on a thought. Oh, I went off and, and I've gone to meditations where they hit the gong and uh, I'm off um, not conscious and they hit the gong 40 minutes later and I realized, oh my God, I was on my breath about six times. So the mind will go off and wander. The mind or the brain is really the one who's wandering and the brain is always making thoughts and emotions and feelings constantly, all the times you're conscious, you're awake. So in meditation, we notice that the mind went to a thought or a sensation, and then we bring it back. The instruction is to, like a puppy, come on, stay, bring it back, come back, stay, come back, stay on the breathing. Don't go chasing thoughts, come back. So the one who is giving the commands you might call the noticer. The noticer is noticing the brain going to thoughts. And that's going to be the key. We're going to notice the noticer. We want to, and even go, in, I like to do it in kind of four groups. So we want to notice that you have a noticer noticing. We want to be aware of the awareness that is aware of things. Um, we want to observe the observer, observing, and we want to be conscious of our consciousness. Anyway, if any, any of those uh, pairs work for you? So that extra level back is important to notice that that's, because that brings you into the moment. That's the mindfulness of, I am in this moment aware that this is going on. Mindfulness is not in flow and not thinking. Mindfulness is not emptying your head. Mindfulness is every single moment really focusing on and aware that I'm aware in this moment without judgment, present. And it is said, IFS believes, I will put on the table for you to consider that when you get to that observer, drop all the parts, drop all the stories and agendas. And um, that's where you can access the eight C's and your better self. Um, something else I wanted to to just go into, oh, lost it. Sorry about the formatting. Uh, I don't know if that came out in the Zoom, but that's when this is. All right, here's a quote I found from Eckhart Tolle. When you recognize that there is a voice in your head that pretends to be you and never stops speaking, <laughs> you are awakening out of your unconscious identification with the stream of thinking. When you notice that voice, you realize that who you are is not the voice, the thinker, but the one who's aware of the thinker. That's, that's it in a nutshell. So um, I don't know if Buddhism and that kind of uh, mindfulness meditation um, would name it as such, but there's at least two parts that are in the brain. and. Uh, IFS has you in meditation. A lot of what we'll be doing will be meditative. Um, 
I will be guiding you in when we do the work, um, is that there is more than one, there's two, and there could be lots of different parts of you that could be present at different at one time or over time. So um, Dick Schwartz says, you know, we, it's our natural state to be multiples. It doesn't mean we're multiple personality. We just have, our mind is made to have a multiplicity so that it can do all the different things it does. So we all have dozens of selves. We can call them selves, voices, parts of the psyche. I always capitalize parts to make them not just a part, but a part, a thing. And so I, I often see myself and suggest to clients if they want that their inner world is a committee of different parts that do different things. And the committee, they're all pretty much on autopilot. They do their thing and, uh, and all parts are trying to help you. So if, if any of you want to read up Dick Schwartz, his, one of his latest books is No Bad Parts. We appreciate every part, at least at first. You know, we always do, but uh, part of it is to develop an openness because that's the best way to get along with somebody is to appreciate them first. If you tell them to get out of here, they then get scared and they double down. So, so inside there's a committee of parts on autopilot and then there's the possibility that you can unblend is the word we use and see if you can access um, a, way, a state of mind that has more self qualities more awareness so we can always choose to add another who is self-led acting in those eight c word ways we can learn to put and you can learn so part of this like in meditation is where am i who, who's under control of who's got the spotlight of attention if you just let yourself go your mind is going to follow thoughts and it's going to be a puppy chasing thing when you have maturity and discipline of mind, you can go, I wanna put the spotlight of attention on my breath in and out for an hour. <laughs> I have never come close to that, but um, we can get better at it. So we can choose to put the effort, the energy into what um, we wanna to try to do. Now, when emotions are strong, you know, we all know that we can't be calm in our best selves when we're furious. It, you know, just adds intense energy. So um, just notice and acknowledge that. You can talk with, learn from, transform parts. So that's, that's what IFS is all about. We notice them, we talk with them, and we uh, get them to realize that what they're doing is not uh, the best for you. And if they would step back or do something a little different or let you lead, um, it'll let... Uh, I call all my clients and uh, people I work with spaceships. You know, some people are like who's driving the bus. I like um, I might put in some Star Trek st stuff um, uh, next week, but um, so um, who's driving the who's driving the spaceship? Is it your Captain Kirk or Picard, or is it somebody from Spock or somebody who has a very specific talent and and. Their job is to look out for some things and then everything is an enemy. And if they were running the, the ship, they'd probably be shooting at all kinds of things. But Kirk goes, no, we need to get to know them first. It's working, thinking from self. So the big picture, going, coming back to the title of our show, of our workshop, to manage strong emotions, anger, deep hurt, sadness, beliefs of not good enoughness or whatever. We need to learn that parts are the ones that hold these feelings and beliefs. And that when we have more self energy, we can work with them and um, heal them, it can be transforming. All right. So I'm going to lead a practice. It's too big. Hmm. This uh, PowerPoint isn't coming out as perfectly as I would have thought on Zoom. So this is a practice called Steps. Uh, John Kabat-Zinn um, teaches mindfulness-based stress reduction. One of my clients um, came to therapy once and said uh, that um, they learned a, a practice called Stop. 
And I said, no, 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 there's, there's something missing here. Um, with stop, it was stop, take a breath, observe and proceed. And I said, no, it's really important that you do not proceed until you have self. Otherwise you won't really change what you've just noticed and noticed isn't what you want. So stop, so steps is stop, take a breath, evaluate. And other words you might use. Um, any kind of self-help always starts with the pause. You gotta notice what's going on and stop. Take a breath, calm down, go to the body. Notice what's going on. I'm anxious, I'm angry, I'm scared. I'm... And then what's going on? Okay, I'm figuring it out. Oh, it's a part is taken over and it's giving me this feeling. So that's the beginning. Stop, take a breath, evaluate. And um, some more description, go to the body, feel it, acknowledge it, what's going on. Watch what the body's doing on its own. You didn't ask for this to happen. This is happening to you, being given to you by your subconscious. And what's it telling you? Is it telling me I'm anxious, I'm not good enough? Um, go for it, <laughs> that may not be very smart. Um, and you can barely see here, but it says, no, you are the observer and not the part. So that's this unblending, stop, take a breath, evaluate. Oh yeah, I'm watching it happen. And then don't proceed until you have self qualities. So if you can notice what's going on and you can calm yourself down, you've stopped, paused, get some clarity. You get some C words here, confidently ask the part to turn it down. That's one of the things that Dick Schwartz says that he brings to psychotherapy is that you can do this. You, know, you can have a part who is like telling you you're an idiot and uh, you can breathe and access another part and you can go, hey, could you turn that down from, from a nine down to a four? Because I can't even be in the world, can't think when you're making so much noise. I kind of see it like a teen who's blasting tunes out of the, his room and, and you open the door and get them to turn it down a little bit so you can share some space. So you can ask parts to turn it down and see if you can bring in some curiosity. I'm gonna use this phrase a lot, drop the story. That's big in, in Buddhism and mindfulness and Eastern spiritualities, maybe in others. Um, but the story is often what gets us into trouble and parts are definitely the ones who put it together. Oh, it was her fault and she did this and she did that. And, um, and the story is what's really bothering you, not the person, it's three years later. So we, we wanna notice that. Um, and I, I, I have names for different kinds of parts. So everybody, I assume everybody, I know I have a very strong storyteller. I can lecture in my head for hours at a time. I call that my storyteller. It's another one that's often working with the storyteller of the identity keeper. So you can't change unless the identity keeper is willing to go, oh, I'm not the damaged one. I'm actually okay. You're gonna need to let that shift. In common language, that might be something like, um, um, damn, I lost it again. I'm trying to fix the screen here. Um, identity keeper. But anyway, um, another C word. And while you're in this, whatever you're noticing going on, have compassion. Maybe it's compassion for the other person. Maybe it's compassion for, you know, I just got triggered and you just reminded me when I was a kid and dad was always putting me down and I just got insulted and I kind of felt that. So have compassion for yourself. All right, that's steps. So. Stop, take a breath, evaluate, and proceed when you have some self qualities. And the quote here, the day you decide that you are more interested in being aware of your thoughts than you are in the thoughts themselves, that's the day you'll find your way out. Kind of a bumper sticker, but supports what I've been saying. All right, so I like to put this stuff in terms of the evolutionary biology, maybe the term. And I see that humans and well, all animals have, but we'll, yeah, we'll go with all animals at this point, 
have systems that need to determine if something is beneficial, harmful, or neutral. I mean, an alligator, you know, he's lying in the water and, and uh, it needs to know when there's a threat. So, and then it'll run away. Um, supposedly trees also do that in different ways, but they're all systems of if there's something uh, bad going on. What was um, a biologist I was just talking to is talking about um, a tree when leaves are being eaten, let off some chemical that lets either other parts of the tree or other trees of the same kind nearby um, know that they need to put more energy into putting water and nutrients into other parts because they're being eaten. Yeah, so uh, lots of these things are selected for. If it's helpful, it, it does more of it. So if it's beneficial, the organism is gonna go towards it, seek more, good food, mating, social behavior, um, having fun. And if it's harmful, then uh, millions of years of evolution have selected for lots of ways to avoid things that are going to um, not be good for the individual and not lead to offspring. <laughs> um, so you may have heard of the negative bias that the brain is um, it's selected for in evolution that those individuals that were more cautious than more, yeah, everything's great. Um, they survive more and uh, it's a beautiful day and the rustling behind me, oh, that's not a lion and it's a lion and he doesn't have offspring. Um, so that moving towards and avoiding is done in part through feelings and thoughts. So when you feel scared, you're gonna withdraw. Your body's telling you that's danger. It's gonna give you the feeling of, okay, this is the survival thing of getting away. And thoughts could be the same thing. Um, oh, that person's really attractive. <laughs> Go towards. So that'll, um, is the energy and maybe even chemistry of uh, making us act towards or away. Feelings themselves, and this is really important, um, are not liked or liked in the body. So we love the feeling that we get, or I do, from eating ice cream or watching a beautiful sunset. And the body is designed to try to get away and avoid at all cost embarrassment and shame and fear. Um, you know, I call those negative emotions, not that they're bad, but that they want to get away from. Um, they may be necessary, but that I call them negative and positive um, sometimes. Um, and we often, we, and so all kinds of survival strategies are selected for and embellished and reinforced that, um, that are about avoiding. So like anger is often a secondary emotion. So when there is the feeling in the body of shame or frustration or futility, the body hates that. And so it's gonna invent, all right, you know, guys, you know, figure out some way we can get out of feeling this. And anger is often a very good way to cover up and try to change what's going on. You're yelling at the person, that person is not gonna be able to shame you anymore although it probably goes back and forth and gets worse. But you can see how anger often works that way. It's trying to get away. Well, in common language, we would say the anger is trying to do something to the person. But what I'm gonna suggest is that the anger that we have is actually out there trying to get away from the feeling that it senses that has been happening or could happen which is what the person is doing, but it's focused on the feelings. All right, organisms develop strategies to optimize getting benefits and avoiding them. In humans, these strategies can be seen in habits, tendencies, behavior patterns, emotional reactions, addictions, aversions, triggers I'll put in there. And in IFS, we're getting to the words now, calls these strategies protectors. This includes all the voices who talk to us and who talk we talk to, etc. So protectors, you'd have a protector part of you who would kick in and give you anger 
if it wants to energize you to do something. And often it's to protect shame or um, protectors could be you know, making you eat. Protectors could make you not eat at all. So there are all of these strategies that are trying to do for you on autopilot what they, when triggered, think is best for your organism. All right. So that, humans are different than zebras. A zebra who's attacked by a lion and the lion's got his fangs and claws in, in the zebra's butt, but the zebra gets away. The zebra shakes it off and goes, whoa, that was close. And then very quickly shakes it off and goes to look for some new grass. If that happened to me, I would have PTSD for life. <laughs> and um, I would assume most humans would. So um, the human nervous system is designed, remember the event, the zebra nervous system, probably because if too many zebras were always anxious, if they'd been chased and almost caught and they'd be nervous wrecks, they would be bad for the herd or they would be more likely to be seen as vulnerable. Um, so, um, yeah, so humans, memory, including severely bad times, so uh, if something terrible happens, the memory's gonna remember it, is a key part of human survival strategies. Trauma is actually a memory that hasn't been proper, uh, processed fully. And that's what we often do in therapy. I do EMDR and IFS. If we can get to a memory and we can help get clear, especially the most important part of a memory is, I got away and I'm fine. <laughs> But um, in trauma, PTSD, that's often not part of the story. It always feels like the thing from the past is still a threat. So a lot is involved in memory. We're going to spend some time on what memory is about and how that works and how we can access it. You and I, we can all, I can say, you know, what'd you have for breakfast this morning? And you can hit play and try to access it. You know, it's amazing. How can we, you know, I think it's pretty cool. And we can access all the sensory information. We can picture the uh, bowl of uh, Fruit Loops. I don't know why I went there today. <laughs> Toast and coffee, um, but the smell of the sugar and the coffee and the sounds maybe clinking of spoons. Um, so that might you might be able to pull that up. You might get words and stories and your wife and you, your partner and you were exchanging. Uh, maybe something about the beliefs that were in there that, boy, does Fruit Loops make me feel good. Um, and the emotions of the time. If um, I was happy and um, I was feeling good and we were connecting and it was silly. So you remember that from this morning and you might have the sensations of being energized with all that sugar and coffee. And the body also takes in stuff. This isn't a good example for, for that, but uh, especially with traumatic memory, often what is held in the body is is not about words and story it's it's the the fear and the tension that may be stored away that still um, affects you all right sorry about this formatting particularly important are the emotions and beliefs in memories they have an impact on every moment of our lives and they are they're probably why you're here <laughs> the emotions and beliefs from your memories and it would be great if we could just go, oh, let's you know, just get rid of them, let it go. But the nervous system is designed, remember those things. So I don't know if I made the point well enough, I went through it. But so the memories remember the negative stuff, everything that happens in order to develop a strategy. That's the important part. So that the organism can avoid the negativity in the future. So it keeps the memory. That's why the zebra doesn't seem to need it. For humans, the memories give the energy towards the strategy, which is the protector, to kick in and do something so I won't get shamed again, so I will act so there won't be bad in the world again, um, whatever. So <clears throat> NS is nervous system. As I said above, wants to not feel those negative feelings. So when you have a memory that's very strong, on shame, fear, negative feelings. IFS calls, these are parts who are holding the memory 
and the nervous system wants to exile the memory. So it pushes it down into the subconscious. If it's bad enough, the nervous system will push it into the unconscious. And that means you can't remember it. You don't know. Something happened in your childhood or last week or in, in, a, mo in a car accident or something, and you just can't remember that time. Your nervous system goes, that's too much, close to death, whatever. And we need, it, it's in there, but we need to bury it. So those are called exiles because the nervous system wants to push them out of your consciousness. Exiles are your memories from the past. All memories are from the past. That whole pain, shame, fear, all of that. And I like to just call exiles wounded parts because sometimes, you know, exiles are filling you up with their experience. All of a sudden, if you're triggered and you're shaking like a seven-year-old, if that happens to you, but happens to many, um, that's really the pain from the past. And that's just flooded you with the past experience and the uh, emotions. So um, they're not exiles anymore. So sometimes I just call them wounded parts, you know, and, um, and uh, in common language, as I mentioned before, you might call that your inner child who's curled up in the corner. All right, so let me give you an example, a little bit more before we take a break. So there's a five-year-old, and let's just say this five-year-old is living in this happy family, and uh, he's in his, what uh, IFS calls his natural state, which is uh, as many of the eight C words as a child has, but he's playful, he's happy, he feels connected, feels bonded, um, he's creative, um, he's curious for sure, and everything's going good. And let's just say his father is a good loving guy, but he had a horrible day, got fired, maybe stopped off at the bar on his way home, and uh, maybe um, the father had a, uh, a soccer ball signed by Lionel Messi, Boy, I've changed this story. Um, and, um, and the kid uh, spilled some ink all over and can't see the autograph. <laughs> so father is pissed and he's had a terrible day. And he goes, oh my goodness, you're a bad boy. Big, the big finger is out. You're a bad boy. He's spitting and his eyes are red and, and bloodshot. You should have known better. I don't want to see you. Go to your room. So the boy's nervous system takes it all in. He takes in all those words and all the stories and all the, um, the beliefs about himself and the sensory information. He's seeing all this stuff and he's taking in the emotions that he, his dad's feeling and that he's feeling. He's shamed. He's scared. He's confused. Maybe he's a little angry. I just said read it. And there's a body. He's tense. He, maybe dad smacked him. Who knows? But um, so all of this information is taken in. I'm bad. I'm flawed. And he's full of all this helplessness. And all of that is stored away in a memory, which we can, which he will be in, talking about therapy in the future. And that is what we would call an exile. The nervous system is going to take it all in, in order to develop, um, develop a strategy. We need to make sure this never happens again. So um, not all memories are remembered all your life, but the stronger they are, the more likely they are. And they will all change over time. And every time you think of them, they change and you put them back. But still, um, we still think that our memories are pretty good about the past. And I think the research says we're not very good at it. The nervous system keeps in the memory, to keeps us all to develop strategies so that this doesn't happen again. Un all these negative emotions, anywhere from unpleasant, uncomfortable, all the way to intolerable, unacceptable, um, are negative emotions. And so they're exiled into the subconscious. Second part, kid goes back to his room, stops crying, the nervous system then employs a strategy to avoid getting those feelings that are in the memory again. So, you may have heard of attachment styles. Two of the attachment styles are, are avoidant and preoccupied anxious. So the boy might go, oh my God, I, I can't go out in the world. It's too dangerous. Dad's gonna yell at me. I'm gonna feel bad. I'm safe for just staying in my room and playing on my phone or playing with my Legos or whatever he's playing with. Um, maybe not as fun if he's five. Um, so that's the avoidant style. And many adults um, have that avoidant style. 
Um, the preoccupied, anxious one is more of a people-pleasing, codependent style. Well, uh, when dad gets home, I'm going to ask him how his day is. I'm going to, I don't know where this came from, but uh, um, it used to be said that the, you know, bring him his, his slippers and his pipe. <laughs> Not sure if that happens anymore, but to do nice things for dad. Um, and then dad will love me and everything will be good and I will be okay in the world. Um, in general, this is a more gender um, Im imbalanced. Men are much more avoidant. De emotions are not the field a lot of uh, men feel comfortable in. Um, so they often don't want to be and are taught not to be emotional and to not, not cry, not to feel things. And the women in their lives are often, you know, hey, do you have any, express yourself, tell me how you're doing. And women um, are much more in the anxious, preoccupied mode of, of uh, often taught to, to nurture and to take care of others. So um, often they'll do that, or anybody will. I just said it's gender imbalance, but anybody can do either of these um, and pay attention to others um, to nurture, to take care of them. Um, often a kid with, Unhealthy parents will find themselves having to parent. And so um, that's a real focus on others and they don't take care of themselves. That's the problem with that. Um, the kid could become hyper vigilant about things in life and uh, now he's really nervous and he's uh, gotta be really careful, could become a perfectionist, could need to control everything um, because it's just the possibility of such an awful thing happening again. So lots of those are all the protectors that are going to kick in. And so those are strategies that become part of this boy's and young man's life. That's uh, his active repertoire of how he will act in the world. Um, I had a client who um, didn't know why, but his mother and father dropped him off with the grandparents and disappeared. And he was freaking out. Why are you leaving me all alone? Maybe he didn't feel so good with the grandparents. And then grandma brought him a plate of apples and he wolfed down, yeah, I don't know, wolf down, but wolf, <laughs> ate all the apples and um, he felt great. And that was the day we remembered as we worked on this, that he began to be eating his way to 400 pounds. So eating was his way to soothe himself. And that is one of his protectors. If you ever don't feel good inside, eat. And eating is a big strategy for a lot of people in a lot of different ways. All right. So um, the, the overall picture of IFS is coming in here. Human beings are in our natural state when we're born and then stuff happens and we get knocked out of Eden and we have exiles and protectors that are added on top that keep us from being our best selves and being curious and calm and connected and we're more nervous and distrusting. So that, and uh, we can get more back to the natural state as we learn to let go of the protector strategies um, and feelings and get more into letting go into uh, self qualities. So summary, to make most of life's journey, we acquire parts. Exiles hold the feelings, the beliefs, the story from past experience. They are stuck in time. Those exiles will, that boy's exile from that memory will stay five for the rest of his life. And he'll be doing a Groundhog's Day, if you know that movie, where he'll be reliving that situation over and over. That part of his psyche will always be living the day he spilled the ink on dad's soccer ball, football. Um, so stuck in time and situation forever unless we get them out. And so you probably wouldn't unless you were doing therapy or had another way to do that. Protectors are the parts that employ strategies to avoid the feelings that are in the exit. Uh, there are two kinds of protectors, managers and firefighters, but I really don't, I've got too many words, terms already. So unless you already know IFS, I'm just, you know, that's where they fit. Parts are probably not our best, most functional, most enlightened, most desirable way of being. So we want to keep naming them as parts and uh, not to judge them, but just to evaluate what's not our best and what could, what could be worked on. And then exiles protectors, and then there's self and self qualities, which is a way to get the parts protectors exiles to step back, turn it down. So you are in a different state. 
Um, often all of these things are merged together a little bit. You're never ever purely a self like your Jesus, Buddha, your dog, Rover, and pure love and non um, But you can have, uh, so that's why I call it quality. So you have some more confidence and compassion. Um, and uh, when Dick does um, a lot of his work, um, we just want to see if there's some curiosity, if there's some curiosity involved um, in what you're doing, that's usually a good sign. Um, if you are sure you're right and or you're angry at something, either internal or external, you're in a part. All right. A little bit more. Self is the natural state, the core of all human beings. It's immutable, can't be broken, can't be gotten rid of. I had a client who we were talking about this and she goes, I think my natural authentic was the word she used. Self is, um, I'm a bitch. <laughs> Sorry. And um, I said, no, that's a part. You may be a bitch a lot of the time, but that's not um, what you could be uh, once we work on seeing why a part feels that being a bitch is in your best interest. And the next weekend, she thought about that. She went and visited her daughter and, and she came back and she said, Jamie, I held in all my comments and uh, didn't say all the things I used to say. And um, I had the best time I've ever had with my, my daughter. <laughs> we really got along. So she uh, put the bitch to step aside and her better self came up. Self can be very spiritual. Um, if you want to, you can see um, accessing self as Buddha mind, big mind, Christ consciousness. Um, if you are a meditator, um, you might be uh, use the terms ego. So it's completely void. Well, as much as you're in self, there's no ego. Um, self with a capital S is kind of equivalent to non-self in some other spiritualities. Um, someone might call it true self, that of God, connected to source. It's uh, moving your way away from story and identity into non-duality. I just like to see self as this is, these are my best qualities. This is the best way I can be. I like seeing self with being warm presence. That's where I kind of go to warm presence, love and kindness, openness. Um, and um, so we can see that that's letting go of parts and stories and, and such. All right, here's a little a big um, thing I put together. You can see in, in bold, the eight C words, and I put the other words around them, um, and love in the middle. I think in our cultures, um, we often think of love as the ultimate. So I don't know if love has all of those and more, but I put it in the middle. <laughs> um, I'm just putting this up. I think you already get the point, but this is a, uh, in a handout that I'll send out. So if you wanna print this out or look at that, so in the live session, I asked people to spend some time, but you might just uh, pause on this a little bit. I'm just gonna put it here and you can pause the video if you want, but um, it'll be a good exercise to spend a minute and think about who comes to mind, a person you know, or a public figure or a fictional character who exemplifies self qualities, who's loving and compassionate and open and calm his warm presence. And then think of a time when you felt that you had a lot of these qualities. You don't have to be Christ, Buddha, Vishnu. <laughs> Just, we've all been there. Um, a lot of cultures, I'm just gonna be broad here, don't want you to be arrogant. You don't want to go, oh, yeah, I was really self-led. <laughs> but no, we, it's important to remember those times. You need, you, you'll want to go back there um, to help with your healing. And then the third question, this is an important one. When do you have very few, little of those qualities? What triggers you into anger and judgment? What brings out your parts? 
That would be a good thing to consider. And then as you think about all the above, you might have a couple of ideas on going forward. How do I live more from self? All right, here's a quote from Dick Schwartz, the founder of IFS. As your parts come to trust you more, you will find that your ability to quickly separate and enter the self state dramatically improves such that you can live increasingly amounts of your life from that place. You'll just have to trust me. That's possible. All right, oh, and here's one, this may be for the handout. So we've got self in the middle, exiles at the bottom, managers, Oh, don't worry about it. Managers and firefighters are both protectors. They are trying to protect from feeling the exile. And we'll, I'm going to take a break here with this cartoon. If you want a positive outlook, you're going to have to turn your chair around, Walter. All right. Thanks for lasting this long. And uh, we'll be back in a few minutes.